Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Distractions change destinies. The things we give our time to becomes our masters. Now, question. How many of you were reading the sign up there yeah. while I was busy speaking? <laughs> we are distracted every single day, all of us. So don't feel bad if that's you. I'm like a goldfish sometimes where I'm busy running around. A friend of mine came and he said his wife, she's a beautiful person, she's a teacher, she's phenomenal. She is the best multitasker I know. But he says she gets so distracted. So he says she'll get up and she'll make some coffee and while she's busy making the coffee, she's moving on to making the bed. And he goes behind her and he finishes making the coffee and then he'll go to the bedroom and he'll follow her and then she's halfway through the bed and she's going to onto something else. And she makes the bed. Now she handles, I don't know how many students every day and she is phenomenal. She's an amazing teacher. But when it comes to home, she gets distracted. We all have moments like that. But you know, God didn't want us to be like that. I want to ask a question before we open up in prayer. How many of you either do this or have had it done to you? You walk into your co-worker's office or you're having coffee with your friend and the cell phone's next to you or them and it beeps and in the middle of a conversation they pick it up and start reading it. Or when they sit down and busy talking to them and things like that, they go, oh, oh sorry, I just, I need to answer this quickly. It's rude. And yet we've all done it or had it done to us. We get distracted. In this day and age, it's so easy. Not that it wasn't back then, but we've got so much stuff that is begging for our attention all the time. And we are all over the place. And you know who misses out? God. Because we are so distracted, even in our prayer times, and doing whatever we do, what God's called us to do, we get distracted. And we either don't do it, or we do it half, or we put it off the procrastination type of, of way. God needs us to start focusing. And that's what my message is all about today. Let's pray. Father God, as I come before you now, Lord, I just praise your name. Holy Spirit, speak through me today. Let it be clear, let it be concise, and let your message get across. Let us realize, Father God, where we fall short, and let us give this all to you so that we walk in your perfect ways all the time in Jesus' precious name. Let us not get distracted or procrastinate or anything else that, that takes up our time and energy, Father God, but let us do what we need to do for you. Let us give you our hearts in Jesus' precious name. And right now, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Touch us and mold us and open our hearts so we hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Right. So, just so that you don't feel alone, I want to tell you about the very, very, very first person that got distracted. And we find that right in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, and it was Adam and Eve. They were put on this earth to do a specific job. Praise God and tend to the garden. That was it. Easy. And what made it even easier is God came to them daily and he spoke to them, and he walked with them, and he told them what to do, and, and he had that relationship with them. How much easier can you get? And yet, the first little distraction, the first little snake or serpent that came along and started whispering things into Eve's ear, she fell. 
And not only did she fall, she took Adam with her. They fell because instead of putting their focus on God, they listened to a serpent which was speaking to their selfish side. The side that they wanted to be like God. And when we are distracted, we are all like that. We are becoming our own worst enemy because we want to be in charge. And that's the sad truth. That's what it boils down to. And God is saying to us throughout the Bible, he says to us, give it to me. Give everything to me. I will handle it for you. I will walk with you in the garden. But we don't do that. We're like, no, nope, I've got this. I can multitask and I can take this on and I can do all of this. And then we get distracted and then we go, oh God, please forgive me. And we start all over again. We see this in Genesis 3 verse 1 to 3. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animal which Adonai, God, had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you are not to eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman answered the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you may either, neither eat from it or touch it or you will die. Verse 4 to 6 says, the serpent said to the woman, it is not true that you would surely die. Because God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it had a pleasing appearance and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. You see what I mean? Reading a text from your mother isn't bad. But when you're reading that text while driving, that's bad. Not everything that we do is bad. There's a time and a place for absolutely everything. When you dedicate your time to reading your texts, it's all good. When you're reading it while you're busy driving, that's not good. When you're reading it while watching TV and then forgetting to answer it or you write in there and you don't present because you are distracted, that's not good. We've got to stop giving ourselves totally to everything around us and we've got to learn to focus. Everything that God has put in our hearts, we do with focus and intention. And when we do that, we will not fall. God has us. He wants the best for us. We see that in so many verses in the Bible. He loves you so much. It says one verse in the Bible, it actually talks about knowing the number of hairs on our head. The fact that he sent Jesus to die on a cross for us, do you not think that he wants the best for us? How amazing is that? And yet we still try and walk on our own. We still try and do things in our own power. And it ends up being a hiding after a hiding after a hiding. One of the things that I learned really early on is that when we do things we know we shouldn't. The anxiety inside of us is so much that you're always wondering who's going to find you out or what's going to happen. What are the consequences to that action? And you end up being freaked out all the time. And that is the same with distraction. We're never fully in a situation because we are so all over the place that we end up falling all the time and we have anxiety because we're not doing it properly. So what is distraction? 
The Webster's Dictionary defines the word distraction as something that directs one's attention away from something else. Simply put, distractions are meant to shift our focus. Now, today we are talking about a situation of our relationship with God. And above all, that is so, so, so important. God is the first thing we need to do in the morning. Throughout the day, it says, talk to him constantly. And at night, it must be the last thing on our minds. But there are so many other things that we neglect because we lose focus. How many people start a diet on a Monday? By Monday night, it's finished. How many of us decide we're going to start learning something new every day? By the next day, it's done. How many of you have ever, ever, ever done a New Year's resolution and it's lasted? Not many people. Because we lose focus. We make everything else more important to us except the thing that we give our hearts to or we should give our hearts to. So what causes distractions? Distractions come from all angles. It can be people, it can be things, social media, big one. It can be a friend that phones you and you know that you've got work to do and she says, let's go for coffee. I was like, oh, no, I'm guilty. <laughs> it can be absolutely everything. That's for something that you are going to have to identify in your life. And if you're serious about this, and I promise you, this will change your life. If you are serious about this, it's going to be a daily thing that you're going to have to do. So what does the Bible say about distractions? Things that distract us from God can be extremely dangerous. If we look at examples in the Bible of people that got distracted or tried to run away from those things that they were called to do, which is distraction as well. We could take Jonah as an example, we'll get to him later. When we are distracted, like Adam and Eve, we are going to fall. And you know what? It is dangerous. It takes us off the path that God wants us to be on. It takes us so far off course that the story, the beautiful story that God wrote for us, ends up being forgotten. And you get people turning around going, What's the meaning of life? <laughs> what is happening? Is this all that we are meant for? The answer is no. God has something miraculous for us. It's something that when we get up in the morning we could be excited about. And yet 99% of people don't see that because they are following in the footsteps of what they think is right or what everybody else is telling them is right or what social media is telling them and you end up getting lost. It is dangerous to get distracted. Losing sight of God also causes us to live in fear, anger, worry, frustration, and doubt. And that's not going to change unless we get rid of distraction. So, let's look briefly at five things that distract, or what the Bible says distracts us. Number one, the carnal things of this world. Okay, and we hear about this word over and over and over again. Here we go 1 John 2 verse 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If someone loves the world, then love for the Father is not in him. 
because all the things of this world, the desires of the old nature, the desires of the eyes and the present, uh, pretensions of life are not from the Father but of this world and the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does God's will will remain forever. How awesome is that promise? God wants us to live forever, but, but we get so distracted with that big flashy car or that beautiful house that a friend has or those little things. Do you know, I've been cleaning out my house now for about three months. And I don't know how many times I've actually looked at my husband and I said, when did I buy all this stuff? Seriously, my house is chock-a-block with things. And you know what? Half of it, more than half of it, means absolutely nothing to me. And yet, I've got to clean it up. And I've got to sort it out. Eight years of clutter. Because it's the latest and greatest. Didn't you know about that cell phone cover with the thing that you put in between your fingers so it doesn't fall? Or um, a TV show that, you know, everybody's talking about so you can't be left off of that. Or the rugby, who's going to win and who's not going to win? In between, you're trying to do dinner and you're trying to run at home and you're trying to get ready for work and you're trying... And it's just stuff. And God's saying, whoa, what about me? I've got something so much more important. Come to me. And we are distracted with all the flashy lights. I read or I heard something many years ago, Joyce Meyer, and she was busy talking. I think it was also about distraction, if I'm not mistaken. And she says, in America, you have signs every little bit flashy signs and, and um, noise sounds and, and all the rest of it. So when you're riding down the street, you're not even watching the road properly. You're so busy with these signs. And that's what our lives have become. We have become so busy looking at the signs that we actually don't notice the road ahead. The things that distract us spiritually end up killing a little part of us all the time because we are missing out on that warm embrace of God and what he has for us. And we end up being caught up in a stream that shouldn't have even taken us in the first place. We have got to stop adopting the ways of the world and we have got to start adopting the ways of the word. We need to bury ourselves in the word. And it says in the Bible that when we seek God with all of our hearts, he will not hide from us. But so many of us are just so distracted trying to get through our prayers as quickly as possible trying to read the word until we fall asleep, that we actually don't even realize, A, what we're reading or hearing God when he talks to us. Number two is our fleshy desires. The carnal world in which we, lives, uh, in which we live offers so much, and that leads to our fleshly desires. And in James 1, 14 to 15, it says, Rather, each person is being tempted whenever he is being dragged off and enticed by the bait of his own desire, then having conceived the desires given birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it will give birth to death. That is powerful. We don't realize that sin is death. And like Adam and Eve, where they turned around and they said, oh, well, or the, the serpent said to Adam and Eve, no, man, don't worry, you won't die. You'll just learn to know what God knows. Spiritual death is the worst kind of death. We think, okay, well, you know what? What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. But that 
they're killing they're killing of your spirit they're killing of your relationship with god is something which we actually need to run away from we don't need stuff we need god number three and there's been so many so many sermons on this one so it's a biggie our thoughts our thoughts are something that grows in our heart and if we do not tap it that will come out in our actions in our deeds in everything we can't stop every thought that comes into our mind we can control what we do with that thought once it surfaces but how many of us actually do that i'll give you a scenario somebody does something wrong to you you act like a christian first of all but when you go home you think about all those things that you could have actually said to that person but didn't the things you'd like to call them the things that you'd like to point out and all of a sudden you realize oh wow you know i'm actually in the right here that person is horrid that person's doing this that and the next thing and i, I you know what i don't want to have anything to do with that person and then every time you see that person that whole feeling comes up again and we start hashing it out in our brain until eventually we're so mean to that person he's going if that's a christian i don't want to know anything about it instead of just turning around saying you know what god i lay this at your feet i'm not actually even going to i'm not even going to entertain that thought i'm going to give this to you in Romans 12 verse 2 and this is coming up a lot in other words do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of the world instead keep letting yourself be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will know what God wants and will agree that what he wants is good satisfying and able to succeed I think it was uh i don't know it was a pastor a few years ago he turned around and said this three things there's the perfect will of god there's the good and there's the i can't remember what the other one hmm? permissible. permissible thanks permissible will of god and the thing is we've got to decide which one we want to live in or the total opposite of not in the will of god at all the perfect will of god is good that's where our satisfaction comes from but as soon as we step out of that and we let ourselves be distracted by this world we actually we're walking with a limp we are half of what we should be number four other people the bible speaks of people being a huge source of distraction and we know this throughout life nehemiah 6 verse 2 to 3 it says san valant and geshem sent me a message which said come let's meet together in one of the villages on the ono valley but they were planning to do me harm so i sent them messages with this message i'm too busy with important work to come down why should the work stop while i leave it to come down to you that's what we need to do if you read the story of nehemiah i mean it's absolutely amazing they built the wall of jerusalem he had to be focused and he did not let anything and i mean anything get in the uh, way of building that wall that's how we are meant to be what god has told us or, or, or led us to be or to do we've got to turn around and go, uh -uh. the work of god is way too it's way 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 too important i am not being distracted by people who want to pull me down we can easily get so caught up in the trouble pain or misfortune we are experiencing that we lose sight of who god is and we find that a lot as well 
so many people are called to God's perfect will. And what we actually do is we let our pain or our circumstances or the fact that our husband was nasty to us or our wives were cheeky to us or whatever, our co-workers don't like us or whatever it is, we let that get to us so much that we actually take our focus off of what God wants for us and we put it on that. And you know what? Some people get stuck there, not for a little while, but for years. And then they turn around and go, I don't know why God didn't use me. Uh, because you were distracted. Another example, like I said to you earlier, was Jonah. He tried to run away from God. He let his bitterness for a, a group of people determine everything. God literally had to drag him back. In 1 Kings 19 verse 4 it says, But he himself went a day further into the desert until he came to a broom tree, and he sat down under it and he prayed for his own death. Enough, he said, now Adonai, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. God wanted to use him, and I mean use him greatly. He used him by pulling him back to change the hearts of a nation. And then he still wants to kill himself and sulk and cry into his porridge. We do that as well. We look at Jonah and we go, what's wrong with him? But we do that too. We need to turn around and say, God, use me. And if it gets uncomfortable, use me. And when I don't want to, use me. I will follow you because I know your ways are better than my ways. So how do we come, overcome distractions? I think there's about eight points. We need to identify what they are. A lot of us are so set in our motion of being distracted and living our life and getting pulled in this way and that way and every way that we actually, we, we don't see we even being distracted. We think that's life. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, So then, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us too put aside every impediment, that is the sin which easily hampers our forward movement and keep running with endurance in, uh, in the consent set before us. We are who our friends are. And we are as much of the word as we read. Now those two statements, I mean, God says, he is the word. We should be spending our time with him every single day. We should be reading our Bible, letting the Bible speak to us, asking the Holy Spirit, how is he going to speak to us through this word? How is this going to change us? Every single day, we should be spending our time in the word. But just as important is our friends. Who do we hang around with every single day that is going to change our mindset that is going to lead us into a, a way of thinking or doing. We need to evaluate our lives in every area. And that negative cousin that just drains you of all your energy and you just want to go home and sleep because all he does is moan, moan, moan. Maybe you've got to think about spending less time with that person. The other one is eliminate whatever distractions you can. Now, this is easier said than done. Because you turn around and you go, okay, Father, I'm having my quiet time. My Bible, my pen, my notebook, my phone, my computer's open, the TV's on because our children are watching TV and we don't want to be distracted, so we'll leave them. 
So what happens? The noise of the TV and every now and again we hear something, so we look up and we watch it. Our phone keeps on beeping, so we're watching messages and answering messages. And by the time we finish doing all of the other stuff, we look at our watch and go, oh, I'm late for work. Read three lines. Okay, God, got my car time, I'm off. And we've missed what God wanted to tell us about the day. We've missed what, he's, what warnings he's actually wanting to give us. We've missed where he wants us to go or the people he wants us to speak to. And we've missed the word, so the word isn't going into our heart. It's going into the air because we didn't even realize or remember what we'd read. We've got to put our distractions aside, TV off. Children can go and play quietly in their room. Uh, uh, the cell phone gets turned off or put into another room. Your computer's closed and it's you and the word. And you listen and you pray and you read, and you reread, and you reread until the Holy Spirit gives you that word, and you start growing, and you start glowing. And when you leave that time, you get up and you're shining, and people turn around and go, wow, what happened to you this morning? A few times you even hear, wow, I see Jesus in you. So change your environment is the next one. Mark 1 verse 35 says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left, went away to a lonely spot, and stayed there praying. Jesus did this all the time. He spent time in the Word. He spent time with God. He knew the scriptures so well that he, he was a, as a child, could quote. God is amazing. And Jesus was amazing. And when we start following his example, and when it says there, he got up early in the morning, he wasn't distracted. Isn't that something we should do? Shouldn't we be following in the footsteps of Jesus? The next one is work as though we are working for God. And we find that in Colossians 3 verse 23. Whatever work you do, put yourself into it as those who are serving not merely other people, but the Lord. Now this is quite a big one. Because a lot of the time we get a job to do, and we do it some days half-heartedly. Sometimes we do the best we can do while not being distracted or while being distracted. When we realize that everything we do, we are putting God's name behind, our lives will change. Because then we are not working for man. We are working for God. And God sees it. And you know what? He is our great rewarder. God will open doors. But when we do things half-heartedly, he can't put his name behind that. The other thing is never ever be confused with being busy uh, sorry, never confuse being busy with being productive. Um, a huge one with this one. But I hear so many people turn around and go, oh, I was so busy. I, I, I was running from pillar to post. Oh, what did you do? I actually don't know. I can tell you I did a lot. But I can't say, I finished this project, I did this, I did this, I did this. I was productive. And do you know the feeling that you get when you are productive? It's like you've accomplished something. 
you feel content within yourself because now you know. You know what, I actually, I, I'm, I'm good. That's put aside. It's not on my plate again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. We've got to learn how to stop making our busy, ourselves busy and, and start making ourselves productive. We've got to monitor our thoughts. And again, like I said earlier, this is a big one. We've got to learn to take our thoughts captive. It's those internal distractions that if we don't get a handle on, can cause us the most harm, and that is what it is. It's an internal distraction. That's what our thoughts, the thought process is. If we do not take it in hand, we will fall. Isaiah, 60, uh, 20, sorry, Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, A person whose desires rest on you, you per, uh, per, let's try to preserve <laughs> in perfect peace because he trusts in you. When we stay focused on God by reading his word and talking to him constantly in prayer, he can help to free our minds from negative mental distractions. And that's important. We have the Holy Spirit who is our helper. We have the Holy Spirit who will lead us and guide us. But we also have free will. So we've got to decide. Are we going to be led by the Holy Spirit? Or are we going to be led by our own minds that fall and break all the time? You've got to reaffirm your goals daily. Moses was teaching the Israelites about the importance of learning the word of God. And Deuteronomy 6 verse 6 to 9 says, These words which I am ordering you today are to be on your heart, and you are to teach them carefully to your children. You are to talk about them when you sit at home, when you are traveling on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them on your hands as a sign. Put them on the front of your foreband, uh, sorry, headband around your forehead and write them on the door frames of your house and of your gates. Do you think Moses was, was saying uh, the word is important here? Do you know in China you get persecuted for being a Christian? And what happens is that you're not allowed to own a Bible there. So what they do, the Christians do there, they write it on little pieces of paper that can be burnt or thrown away or whatever it is. And they sit with those pieces of paper and they memorize that verse so much that they know it. It's inside of them. They are literally eating, breathing, sleeping the word. So when eventually they go into uh, their home churches and they sit on those cold floors, they'll turn around and they have one or two Bibles between them. And those that have memorized this portion of the word, they hand the Bible to the next person who hasn't memorized their verse. And then they meditate on that verse in their home churches. And then if a verse comes up, then they'll pass the Bible on to the next person because that one knows that verse off by heart. How many of us can say, oh, we know a handful of verses off by heart? Let alone chapters. We need to eat, breathe, sleep the word. We need to make it so much a part of us that we are writing it on our, our foreheads and in our hearts and on our door frames and so we see that word all the time we need to speak the word continuously because a victorious people speak the word we were told today that we have the promise of Abraham how many of us are walking in that promise how many of us can actually say we are victorious in the Lord? 
we need to get our hearts right and we need to start walking that walk. The next one is beware of the devil. The devil came to try and distract and tempt Jesus. The devil, uh, um, uh, he, he, he won the battle with Adam and Eve. And throughout the Bible, he's won battles left, right and center. We need to beware, and that's where speaking and praying for wisdom from God, where we understand that every situation is not always from God. Sometimes it's a pitfall and a snare of the devil. And we've got to realize that the distractions that he sends our way are not from God. We've got to beware the distractions in our life so we can focus on God and know the difference between God's voice and the enemy's voice. If the devil can manage to distract us with temptation and problems, he will keep us from being productive and accomplishing what God wants us to do. He wants to keep us out of the calling of God. There's a newsflash. The devil doesn't like us. He wants to kill and steal and destroy from us. But we've got the choice. We have been bought with a price, which means that all of those things that the, that the enemy wants to do to us, they have no power unless we give them power. James 4 verse 7 says, Therefore submit to God, moreover take a stand against the adversary, and he will flee from you. He will flee from you. We don't have to live in defeat. God is with us. The other thing is recognize and take advantage of good distractions. Now, that might sound a little bit weird considering we're talking about distractions in general, but there are good distractions that we actually need to take hold of. We need to um, stay focused and overcome distractions. Doesn't mean work and no play. We need to take a break. And women, you men don't talk as freely as we do. So I'm using us women as an example. We get so caught up in our jobs of being a wife and a mother and um, a, a employer and uh, a, a a taxi driver and, 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 and that we actually don't take a break. I know so many women that have burnt themselves out because they didn't take the right distraction. They got so worked into doing the distractions of life that they didn't get to spend time with God the way they should. They didn't get to take a walk with their family the way they should. We need to learn about the good distractions and discern between the good distraction and the bad distraction. In Luke 10 verse 38, it says there, uh, sorry, 38 to 42, it says, on their way, uh, Yeshua and his talisman, which is his disciples, came to a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Miriam, or Mary, who, was, uh, who also sat at the Lord's feet and heard what he had to say. But Martha was busy with all the work to be done. So, going up to him, she said, Sir, don't you care that my sister has been uh, leaving me to do all of the work by myself? However, the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are fretting and worrying about so many things, but there is only one thing that is essential. Mary has chosen the right thing, and, he won't, uh, and it won't be taken away from her. 
I always battled with that first. See, I'm a Martha. I'm a doer. I will make sure that the coffee's done and the cookies are done and the food is done and, and I don't take advantage of the good distraction. The actual food and, and entertaining didn't matter in this instance. The Word of God mattered. How many of us turn around and say, oh, I can't go to that church meeting or that praise and worship meeting or spend time because I promised so-and-so I'd go to her house and help her with her hair or her whatever, her cat or, or whatever. And we've missed out on the good distraction. And because we've missed out on that good distraction, we are the ones that suffer. We are the ones that have been pulled to pieces because we've had no time to rest. But instead, we are overworked, we are overtired, and we are freaked out on the inside. The anxiety is eating us all alive because we didn't learn to rest. So don't be caught up in your goals and the goals themselves because of distraction from what is most important in your life and that is God. It's never, ever, ever too late to turn back. The one thing about God is he's so merciful and his grace abounds forever. He is a good, good God and you know what, as soon as you turn around and go, you know what Lord, I don't want this life where I'm running and I'm, I'm watching and I'm, I'm, I want to be focused. I want to learn how to live my life and live it to the best. I want a temple that belongs to you, Father God. Show me how to do that. I want to be able to work that brings you glory. Show me how to do that. And when you are faithful in the little, God will give you much. I hope this message helped you as much as it did me. I've still got lots and lots of work to do, but I'm trying to put these steps into place. It is so important, so important. This is probably one of the, the most important things that I've had to learn in my life. And I'm begging all of you, in order to live the best life that God has for you. Let's stop getting the negative distractions mixed up with the good distractions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as I come before you now, Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for your heart. I thank you, Father God, that in this day and age, when we are so distracted, that, Lord, you do forgive and you do lead us back to you in Jesus' precious name. Father God, we worship and adore you and we give you all the praise. And Lord, I speak to your congregation now, prepare hearts. And for each and every single person that is sitting here right now, if that is you, if you've let distraction move you so far away from God that there's nothing, there's, there's no God in your life anymore. There's only things that you have to do on a daily basis. I want you to, to come up here and let me pray for you. I want you to, to say to God and be honest with yourself that from this moment things are going to change that I am going to be what God wants me to be. And for all of those that don't know God, that have never known God, that don't realize that the God that I'm talking about, the good God, the one that's written our names and, and, and given us so much, the God that that is uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that is of every single one of us. 
If that's you and you don't know God, I'm asking you to please come up afterwards and, and pray with me. God is calling you. He loves you so much. He doesn't want any of you to go down that road of distraction that leads to death. So if any of those invitations apply to you, please come up with, uh, and, and pray with me. Father God, as we come before you now, Lord, I just thank you for this time that we've had with you. I thank you, Father God, that your angels encamp around and protect each and every single person here as they go their separate way and that you hold them in your hand, Father God and you bring them back safely next week. I thank you, Lord, that any distraction, anything that is pulling your servants away from you, Father God, your children away from you, that, Father God, you, you help them, that you lead them, you guide them into the ways they should go in Jesus' precious name. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. You are our everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.